please stand with me this morning for our reading. It will take place from the book of Romans, and that is chapter 8, and it's on page 944 if you're using one of the Pew Bibles this morning. For this morning's reading, I'll be reading verses 1 through 4 from Romans chapter 8. Please follow along with me as I read. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. May the Lord add His blessing this morning to the reading of His Word. You may be seated. I want to give you a brief phrase to summarize the message this morning. That if you were to leave here this morning and someone said in the car, hey, what was he preaching about today? You'd be able to say very succinctly what this sermon is about. And what I hope you would say is he talked about Christmas's effect on right now. Christmas effect on my life right now. Where you're sitting, on the drive home, when you get home, the next time you encounter sin, the next time you encounter temptation. This message is about Christmas's effect on our right now in our lives and in your life and mine. I want to give you, we just have two points this morning in the message, in our outline, and, that, and those are these. The first is the off-ramp from law. Let's read that together, the off-ramp from law, and then the second let's read together, the on-ramp to Christ. Let's try that one more time. The first, the off-ramp from law, second, the on-ramp to Christ. If you're just visiting with us for the first time, we completed right before December started a journey through the Ten Commandments from Exodus chapter 20. And I guess the best way I could put it in summarizing that journey for me is to relate it to the pandemic. And the way that I put it is this. That there's a way in which the pandemic should cause us to experience a newfound appreciation for our immediate circle of family and friends and co-workers and church friends due to the realization of how long they've put up with our bad breath without saying anything. That was meant to be funny. (laughs) You wear these masks and you have a new appreciation for the people who spend time around you all day long and never comment on your breath. You realize for the first time, maybe, just how bad it is. And you're not laughing because you don't want to act like it's true for you and you just want me to be a spectacle up here. But I know you all know what I'm talking about. We came to a a new appreciation for these folks as we came to a new realization of our stinkiness. And there's a sense in which what masks did to our knowledge of our breath, the Ten Commandments do 
to our knowledge of our interior lives. At least that's what they're meant to do. If you read the Ten Commandments rightly, if you interpret them to the degree to which Christ interpreted them, which is the right way to interpret them, then you realize that the Ten Commandments are not talking about all these external things, though that could be easy to walk away thinking. The Ten Commandments are saying things in such a way that you begin to peel layers off and say, well, if He meant this, then He probably meant this. If He meant don't commit adultery, He probably meant don't think inappropriately about another person. Either emotionally or lustfully or in comparison to your spouse or anything of the like. The Ten Commandments were meant to go deep. Not to remain surface. But that's how they read it, the Israelites. That's why they come to Jesus and they say, what must I do to be saved? He says, well, you know all the commandments. They say, I've kept them from my youth. How could anybody say that unless they read it wrongly? So the Ten Commandments, in a sense, are like a mask in the pandemic that wake us up to our stench. That's the point. If you've read them rightly, you will come to that conclusion. That your interior life is abhorrent. It's filthy. It's rotten to the core. So Jesus will say to these people who thought they kept the law. He says, you look good from the outside, but inward, you're full of dead man's bones. You're a rotting corpse. If we peel back the layers as the ten were meant to do. So I've read this morning from Romans chapter 8. What we didn't read is Romans chapter 7. And in Romans chapter 7, Paul gives you his personal journey through the Ten Commandments. Exactly. Speaks of the Ten Commandments, specifically of coveting, and what that did to show him how dirty his interior life actually was. So Romans 7 is basically a journal entry from Paul showing what he looks like when the mask of the law is put on his heart. How, how rank he finds his heart to be. He speaks of the waywardness of the members of his body, the unrestraint of his soul, the weakness of his flesh, his proneness to wander, the coarseness of his thoughts, his fumbling unfamiliarity with true righteousness, his inept moral aptitude. There's a part of Paul which he journal entries that says, I'm drawn to righteousness. I, I want that. But his flesh quickly dismisses that notion. Deeper than his desire to do what's right is an undermining pull towards sin that leaves him broken and spent in a dark alley time and time again. Yesterday, with all the Christmas festivities and all the good food that we made or that was given to us, Oreo got more than his portion of food, somehow, some way. And so he threw up on our living room rug. And we cleaned it up, but then he wandered back to the exact spot where we had cleaned it up. And I said to the boy, it's kind of a boy conversation. I said, guys, you know what he's looking for? He's looking for his vomit. And we had a brief discussion about Proverbs that just like a dog returns to his vomit, so we return to our sin. And this is what Paul discovered. As, as abhorrent as it was in one sense of his mind, he craved it. He went back time after time again. As much as he wanted to flee from it, he kept coming back to it. On our wilderness trips with the men, we occasionally do a trip in, in a lake sort of area. The place that we frequent is Algonquin Provincial Park in Ontario, uh, Canada. And occasionally, if you're in a canoe, you, you always have a canoe partner. Sometimes you're in the back and sometimes you're in the front. And occasionally, when you're in the front of the canoe, you'll be paddling along this lake. Sometimes the wind's against you and it's a lot of work to paddle. And you'll get this like strange sensation when you're in the front of the canoe. I don't hear my partner's paddle. Strange. 
And you don't want to look back because that wastes time and you miss a paddle stroke or two. But you say, well, it's worth checking, actually. So you turn back and sure enough, his paddle's not in the water and he's drinking, you know, and it's like, bro, get it together, man. Let's do this. And that's kind of like sin, but it's not close. And here's why it's not close. Sin in us is not just sitting dormant, paddle out of the water. Sin inside of us is actually backstroking. It's, it's pulling you in the opposite direction of where you want to go. And here's also how it's different. It's not someone else back paddling. It's you. It's a part of you going in the exact opposite direction of where you want to go. You look at the law. And you admire it. You attain to it. And yet there's a part of you that craves its opposite. And that is the part of us that seems to consistently win. And this is where Paul is at in Romans 7. There are different views on Romans 7. I do not take the view that Paul is speaking from his former life before Christ. I think Paul is speaking from his current life in Christ. That this is, ta- this is a an conver- inward conversation with Himself that's taking place in the faith. This is what I believe to be all the people in Christ. This struggle. This is me right now. And this is you right now. It's important to catch that Romans 7 is building off the ten. The ten words basically parade before us what it looks like to be full humanity. That's what the ten words are. The ten words, you can look at it this way, are like a skeletal frame. And when Jesus comes into earth, He basically puts skin and flesh and blood and brains and all of it on these bones. And Jesus, to look at Jesus, is to look at the Ten Commandments embodied. The Ten Commandments give to us God's intended disposition for us. Our gait, the the way we talk, the way we respond, the way we think, our actions, our character. And we love the Ten Commandments. We say, man, if, if I could live like that, that would be incredible. But the moment we attempt to live like that, in and of our own flesh, we might as well be on top of the Empire State Building and tell everyone around, I'm Superman, watch this. Because in the flesh, you and I have absolutely zero hope of fulfilling the Ten Commandments. Commentator Alec Moyer puts it this way, each commandment represents some aspect of the likeness of God. And therefore, obedience to God's law gives expression to what we really are. What we're meant to be. Being God's, being in God's likeness and results in our true freedom. And that's a beautiful quote. But when we read it, we, we find that when we read the ten and understand them, we don't find ourselves more free. Instead, we find ourselves more bound. We're bound, not to the righteousness of the law, but to the nature of sin. The Ten Commandments highlight and expose and illumine our inner tendencies, much like a black light illumines a shady hotel room where a wicked crime took place. They expose us for who we really are. The Ten Commandments speak truth to us in love about who we are down deep. The part of us that when it comes to the surface, we look around to see if anyone saw it or heard it, observed it. Because it's the part that we like to keep hidden. But the ten words draw it out. When the rich young ruler comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to be saved? And he said he's kept the commandments. And then Mark records that Jesus looked at him and loved him and said, you lack one thing. Go. Sell all that you have. Give it to the poor. And come follow Me. He exposed 
the part inside of him that he didn't want anybody to see. But Jesus saw that. And it says when he heard the words, he walked away sad for he was a very, very wealthy man. Jeremiah asked this question. Jeremiah 13. Can the leopard change its spots? Neither can you do good who are accustomed to doing evil. This is the place Paul's speaking from. You, you, you exit the Ten Commandments leaving altogether condemned We no longer, if we've read them rightly, we don't wince at the phrase that says there are none who are righteous, no, not one. But we fully, utterly, unadulteratedly agree with that statement. Yes, there are. There's none righteous. And I am one of those who are not. Authentically, I can say that. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God in which we were intended to thrive. I've fallen short. I've experienced that. I tasted it. It's more familiar to me than any other taste I can imagine. I'm familiar with failure. Now, we want to ask, why couldn't the law do what it was ostensibly intended to do? God has just liberated His firstborn from Egypt, and now He's giving them the house rules. You're now my son. You're my daughter's. This is what it's like to live in my house. These are my rules. This is my character. If you're like me, people will never doubt your word. Your spouse will never doubt your fidelity. You'll enjoy walking with me more than any other joy on planet earth. Your eyes won't wander and saying, what would it be like if I had this or did this? Or No. You'll enjoy right now. You'll be in the moment everywhere you're at. You won't covet. You won't, do any, you won't be anything like that. You'll be like Christ. This is why I'm giving you the law. To be like my son. To be like my character. Jesus was the most sought after person everywhere He went. And that is by sinners. They loved Him. They wanted Him in their presence. They just cherished their time with Him. He was... In extre- Dane Ortland says he was the most approachable human being that's ever lived. If you don't think that about Jesus, you're wrong because the Gospels prove it. Everybody sought his attention. They liked to be with him. So if this law is so admirable, so lovely, so beautiful, smells so wonderful, why did it fail? Why did we not become that? God gave it for that purpose. At least that's the way the text reads in Exodus. I'm giving you my character now that I have you in my possession and out of Pharaoh's. So why didn't his character translate? Why didn't it get transposed upon us? Well, Paul tells us very frank, frankly in Romans 8, 3. This is what he says. The law weakened by the flesh could not do. The law weakened by the flesh, could not do. The law was perfect. The law was perfect. But it was weakened by our flesh. So, when you come to the Ten Commandments, for any of you who play Euchre or other card games or whatever, and you fold your hand, because you've got nothing to offer your partner, you've got nothing to offer your situation, That's what the Ten Commandments calls you to do, essentially. Every one of us. We fold. We can't keep playing. There's no way we can attempt truthfully to attain them, let alone maintain them. Because our flesh is weak. This is why when Jesus opens His Sermon on the Mount, the very first words out of His mouth When he looks at the crowds, he says, Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Being poor in spirit is the bus stop that you get out of the law. If if, if the law is a bus, you come up and the, 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 the bus driver, the conductor of the train says, Next stop, poor in spirit. Next stop, defeated. Next stop, 
bankrupt. Next stop, no hope. You say, yeah, that's, that's, that's my stop. That's where I get off. That's why Jesus says, I didn't come for the healthy, I came for the sick. The sick is where the law should have escorted you. To see your sickness. To see your stench. Paul is decimated by the law. He's broken to pieces. He's shattered. Let me put it this way. To be of the tribe of poor in spirit is to be of those folks who know in their gut if they are going to get righteousness, it needs to come from another place. It needs to come from an alternate source. I'm hopeless otherwise. This is the off-ramp of the law. Romans 7.24 Paul, after exposing his inner man, says, Wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? The law, in a sense, leads you to a cliff. And the sign as you're going down the interstate towards the cliff is make it a cross. But you know your car weighs X amount of pounds. You know your car doesn't have wings. You know you don't have righteousness. You know you're utterly hopeless. You want to make it a cross. It's, it's advantageous. It's beautiful. It's, it's full humanity. It's true humanity. But you know you don't have true humanity. You know you're damned. You know you're doomed. It's, uh, it's effectively hopeless. This is what the law does. And this is what leads us to the on-ramp of Christ. We frequently go to Canada as a family, hoping to be able to go this summer on an upcoming sabbatical if it's not closed, the borders. But you, as you drive up to Canada, you drive past a sign that says, last off-ramp before the border. And you're kind of like, you don't want to get that wrong. Like, if you're not intending to go to Canada, you better take that because you will be in big trouble time-wise. Waiting at the border, turning around, looking like a fool. I, I'll tell you a brief story of where I look like a fool. I, I served as an intern for two summers in Sault Ste. Marie, uh, Michigan, and um, I always get nervous crossing the border. You can tell the guys in the wilderness trip and they'll tell you stories, but... I always am nervous doing that, and one time I went to cross, it's where I bought Becky's engagement ring on the Canada, because the exchange rate was better. And uh, I was crossing for the first time, I was really nervous, I'm in college, and the Border Patrol agent says, uh, country of citizenship, and I said, Illinois. And he says... I said country. We get a lot of that from people from Iowa, but not Illinois. <laughs> no offense, Iowans. So, you cross, you're headed to this cliff, and you cross this sign that effectively gives you the feeling of the last off-ramp before the cliff. And you're like, you look at your spouse, you look at your friends, and you say, it's, it's as good as done. And lo and behold, there is an on-ramp just when you thought there was nothing left. And this on-ramp takes you in a circle and leads you to a bridge. The mightiest bridge you could ever possibly fathom. This bridge, in fact, is so unbelievably mighty. Just catch the audacity of God. It is so ostentatiously mighty that it actually makes the chasm look small. And you say, that, I, are, you, are you minimizing sin, Ben? Are you making sin seem small? Sin is huge. Sin is, you're all about it. It's a big deal. We'll take it from the Apostle Paul in Romans 5.20. Look at how he puts it. 
the law came in to increase the trespass. It's the mask that makes you smell your stench of your heart. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. That however low you think your sins sunk you, God's grace is deeper. It goes further. However mighty sin is, whatever torrent sin picks you up, God's grace is stronger than the torrent. It grounds you again. God's grace is bigger than your offenses. That's the point of Christ. To paraphrase a quote by Tim Keller, he says the law shows us that we're more sinful than we ever could have imagined. But at the same time, Christ shows us that we are loved more than we ever dared think possible. Let me offer another analogy. We've just been through the Exodus in Exodus chapter 12. And they, they leave Egypt. Now just imagine that they encounter the Red Sea. And the Red Sea is this huge body of water that they know they are utterly hopeless to, to cross in and of their own efforts. That is like keeping the law. You, you can't swim across. You know you're doomed to drown in this huge body of water. There's no hope. And then you look behind you and you see Pharaoh with all his troops coming at you. And that's kind of like your past. That you can't outrun your past. It's catching up with you. You're, you're damned. You are between two things that are going to swallow you up one way or another. There's no way out. Until Christ comes and the body of water parts. And what you thought was impossible all of a sudden just got made possible by Jesus. This is the point of Christmas. Romans 8, 1-4. Let's look at it one more time. There is, therefore, now, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending His own Son, Christmas, in the likeness of sinful flesh, and first sin, he condemns sin in the flesh at the cross in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. I want to comment on the beginning of that verse and the end of that verse. Here's what you need to catch. In Romans 8, Paul is the same Paul that spoke in Romans 7. The defeated, the agonizedly defeated Paul in Romans 7 is the exact same Paul that's writing in Romans 8. Let me give you an analogy. Imagine that I'm in a battle and I'm stuck with as many arrows that will fit my body. But I'm still barely alive. I'm about to die. It's the last moments before I die. I'm stuck with a thousand arrows. I fall to my knees. I look around me in my last breaths to see if I have any other potential resources, reserves, allies, items in which I can boast, assets, advantages. But I look around and just like all the other fallen soldiers, they are hopelessly, motionlessly dead. I have nothing. I am about to die and everything I thought might maintain my life is also dead. Like soldiers in a field. That's Paul in Romans 7. And I turn. After I look and I see nothing's left. Nothing can help me. I turn and I look forward. This is my last glimpse before the blood leaves my body and I pass out dead. The last thing I see are myriad upon myriad troops hurling toward me. Spears drawn. Bow and arrows drawn. Ready to give me more of a whooping. They're my sin. They're my shame. They're my guilt. I am as good as dead. And as I'm beginning to fall to the earth, my last thing that my ears will audibly hear is God screaming from the heavens, Victory! That's the audacity of Romans 7 to Romans 8. Paul is saying, I'm, I'm as good as dead. It's completely over. And in that state, 
God the Father in Christ cries victory. And you're like, no, 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 Ben, talk to me after the service. i got to grab one of those books, and I want to tell you just how bad my history is. Just how bad my browsing history is. And Christ calls you victor. When He looks at that browsing history, He calls you victor. And you say, but everything in my past says failure. And God calls me a victor? That's the Gospel. Friend, at every point in your life and mine, we are a razor's edge from total defeat apart from Christ and complete and total untouchable victors in Christ. It's not as though, don't misunderstand me, it's not, what I'm trying to clarify is, it's not as though once we're saved, we begin to develop a margin of personal righteousness so that if I screw up, you know, 30 years into my life, I have a pretty healthy margin of a bank account that I can accept a few losses of sin without totaling out to zero. No, that's not the gospel. You don't gain collateral over time in order to maintain status when you sin. In Christ, you and I are fully and totally billionaires at all times. When we sin or when we don't. Our sin doesn't lessen our account and our righteousness doesn't raise our account. We are billionaires at all times. Why? Because our righteousness is not our own. It's Christ's. So our bank account does not fluctuate at any time. You're not less of a Christian when you sin or more of a Christian when you don't. Because your Christianity is not yours. It's Christ's. You ride on His account. That is the truth of the Gospel. And if you don't believe me, believe Paul. Ephesians 2, 4-9. God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places. In Christ Jesus. So you're sitting with Jesus in the heavenly places. Does He ask you to get down from that seat when you sin? Not according to Paul. So that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable richness of His grace and kindness toward us in Christ. Sin has a length. It has a measure. Christ's love does not have a measure. It's immeasurable. His grace is immeasurable. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not as a result of works. So that no one may boast. There's a fascinating place where this gets exhibited in the Gospels where Jesus is about to be crucified. It takes place in Mark 14. Jesus, you get the idea, is as good as dead. As Pastor frequently said, He's dead man walking, as it were. He's standing before the high priest. People are making all sorts of accusations against them. All of them false. The high priest says to Jesus, have you no answer to make? What is it that men, these men testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. And the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? So just imagine, Jesus is about to die. He knows that. Everybody knows that. He's not going to survive this trial. And Jesus, as good as dead, like a million arrows in him, falling to his death, listen to how he responds to the high priest. And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Tears His garments and kills Him. But Jesus demonstrates in total defeat, utter victory. Do you see that? What does that mean for us? How does this translate to us. 
Well, it translates to us in a quote that I've paraphrased for you before, but I want to read to you now. And uh, Finn or Caleb, jump ahead if you would to the next slide. This is written by someone who is a believer recovering from homosexuality and overcoming in that struggle. And I want, I want you to read how he describes his life in Christ amid a body filled with ruin and death. In Christ, God declares me to be righteous, washed, pure, and set apart for Him. And yet, there is nothing in my experience to suggest that these things could be so in and of myself. That's Paul in Romans 7. If I live by my own estimate of my life, I act accordingly. Alternatively, I can surrender my life to the Lordship of Jesus and live by God's assessment of my life. So whose word will I live by? I am glad to live by God's Word and the blessed release that it brings, looking by faith to Him for who I am, looking in love to my brothers for what I do. By His Word, I am directed outward and never inward. This is the magisterial truth of the Gospel. You can choose to look inward and live in Romans 7 and consistently fail to the flesh. Or you can choose to live outward based on what God says about you and live in righteousness. Why? How? How is it possible that you live in righteousness? Well, what did Jesus give us? What's the gift that Jesus gave us, gave us when He ascended to the Father? He gave us the Spirit. Catch this. Commentator point, pointed out in Romans chapters 1 through 7, first seven chapters of the book of Romans, spirit in the Greek a, appears five times. In chapters 9 through 16, so up to Romans 7, skipping chapter 8, now the rest of the book. Romans 9 through 16, the word spirit occurs eight times. In chapter 8 alone, the word Spirit, most commonly referring to the Holy Spirit, occurs 21 times. Chapter 8 alone. More in that New Testament chapter than any other New Testament chapter in the New Testament. The Spirit has an explosion in Romans chapter 8. Why? How? What does it mean? Because we are able to fulfill the law now. This is the bridge that we're riding on over that chasm. We are able to fulfill and walk in righteousness right now. How? According to the Spirit. Not according to Jaron. Not according to Bram. Not according to Joe. Not according to Mickey. Not according to us. According to the Spirit. I'm going to... I'm gonna, Acquaint you with an argument, let you in on an argument that Pastor Alex and I have occasionally. You ready for it? This is the difference between my age and his age, I think. We argue about how to listen to music. More, more to the point, how to pay for the music we listen to. Okay? Now you're like, you pay for music. Don't just stop. Don't start. Don't start. You drink that, you drink Starbucks, you pay three dollars. Don't, don't start that discussion. That's the next age. So I'm here, Alex is here. People arguing with me about paying for music, or they're, you're, you're the next age. But here's where, here's where our source of argument lies I have an iTunes account where I buy the music I like so I can listen to it anytime. Alex, I don't know if he's still doing it, so don't judge him. Just leave him alone. He, he still does it. He pays, and many other young people like him, pay for a, I don't even know what to call it actually, a streaming subscription, let's call it. This is a, this is a payment they pay every month so that they can listen to music. Now, I pay for my music 
and it's mine. I have it. It's mine. I own it. I can listen to it anytime I want because I bought it. He pays a subscription every month. Now, so, now, the limit of my side is I only have the music I bought, of course, right? And, you're, and the 80-year-olds are saying, and the radio. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Okay. But that's the limit of my view. I only have a certain selection of songs. Becky gets mad at me for our limited selection of Christmas music. It's according to what I bought. Alex, on the other hand, pays a subscription to his music, and he can listen to any song basically ever imagined. I, it's like unbelievable. I'm like, oh, there's this one song. He's like, I can find it. I'm like, no, you can't. Just give me a second. And he finds it. Now, my argument is that that subscription, what are they going to do? 40 and older people. They're going to keep raising the price of that subscription. It started here, but it's going to keep getting bigger. And eventually, he's going to say, I can't afford this anymore. It's way too expensive. I'm going to cash out. I'm done. And then what? What does he have? Nothing. He has absolutely nothing. Now, their argument against my side is I basically never listen to them, so I don't really know what their argument is against my side. <laughs> but the point of what I'm getting at is this. That your righteousness in the Spirit is more like Alex's subscription. My side's kind of like, I own my righteousness. I, I, I did it. That's my claim. Alex's side is, it's not mine. I don't own this music, actually, but I have access to it. I have access to unimaginable, an unimaginably wealthy library of music. I don't own any of it, but it's all there for the taking. That is akin to life in the Spirit. You don't have righteousness. You don't have it. You don't own it. But you have access to a wealth of a library of righteousness that's there for the taking should you choose to access it in the Spirit. The law is given to us. But what's not given is the Spirit in the Old Testament system. What's given in Christ is the Spirit. And now we have the ability, which we formerly didn't have, to walk according to righteousness. To walk across that bridge. To drive across that bridge. Not as a result of our own strength. We didn't build that bridge. Christ built that bridge. And He gave us the Spirit to walk through it. So, how does Christmas affect you right now, friend? Christmas affects you right now because the righteous will live by faith. Why? Because there is no other righteousness out there. There's no, there's no access to it. You have no option. You have no option internally. You have no option by modeling someone else's life. You have no option of beating everybody else out. You're hopeless. You, you're damned. You have no hope except an alternate righteousness that comes from the outside and is given to you on the inside. And now, you have the Spirit. And by the Spirit, you're able to walk in these categories that you never thought possible because of the Spirit. It's not yours. It's given. Jesus gave you the Spirit to live by the Spirit, to fulfill the law that you could never attain to. So the next time you're tempted to sin in your flesh, walk by the Spirit, not according to the flesh, which ends in death. And say, I'm going to access this wealth through Christ and live by the Spirit. That is, we asked the kids last night at dinner, what's the best Christmas present you got? And Esther was the best. She, she couldn't stop saying, this is the best one. And there was also this one that was the best one. She basically went through all her presents. These are all, they're all the best. That was really awesome. But the best Christmas present you got from Christmas is the Spirit of the living God that enables us to walk as sons and daughters of God. Are you walking by Him right now?
It's, there's, it's yours for the taking. Amen? Amen. I'll ask musicians to come.